This is lecture 7 of Principles of Metabolism, where we will look at the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle is probably the most well-known metabolic pathway of all. Um, it is really a centerpiece of metabolism, um, and it's probably most well known for its role in, in oxidation of substrates. So really, the TCA cycle, if you view it in kind of high-level view, uh, it's a flexible enzyme system that is able of accepting a variety of substrates uh, and oxidize these to carbon dioxide and, and extract energy from them. And the way it really works is that a variety of compounds, amino acids, sugars, and fats, uh, can be converted in various steps into certain carboxylic acids, a few central metabolites which fit into the TCA cycle, so, and actually are components of the TCA cycle. Uh, and these carboxylic acids can then be oxidized in the cycle, and, and, and then energy can be extracted from this. So let's look at the oxidation of acetyl units a bit more in detail in the TCA cycle. So in this mode of operation uh, of the cycle, we have an acetyl unit in the form of acetyl-CoA, uh, that enters the cycle being uh, joined or, or, or condensed with oxaloacetate to form citrate, which is a six carbon compound. So, as you can see, uh, citrate is a tricarboxylic acid, so it has three of these carboxyl groups, and that's a feature of most things, uh, the, the, the uh, acids in this cycle, that they have a lot of, of carboxyl groups. Uh, and so, they are pretty oxidized already, and they're kind of ripe for cutting off these uh, carboxyl groups, generating carbon dioxide and, and liberating some energy. And so in the cycle, starting from citrate, at each step we have a kind of successive oxidation of this compound uh, in, until we come full circle and go back to oxaloacetate. Uh, so there are several dehydrogenases you see in this picture. And what these enzymes do is that they, uh, they remove electrons uh, from these substrates, so they oxidize them, they transfer it to NADH, uh, and in a couple of steps we are cleaving of carbon dioxide as we do this. Uh, so this happens uh, in isocitrate dehydrogenase, in the first steps. By the way, I have skipped a couple of, of isomerization steps uh, here, but just to simplify things a little bit. Um, and in this step we get alpha-ketoglutarate, which is a 5-carbon compound, so now we have lost one CO2. Uh, in the next step, another oxidation, something happens uh, to this uh, carboxyl group. This gets cleaved off. Again, it's an oxidation reaction, so it, it uh, liberates some energy. And in this case, we are able to make ATP in this step. Uh, this gives a four carbon compound now, succinate. Uh, and then we have a sequence of reactions that oxidizes succinate further. So first we are able to oxidize this part of the molecule, these carbons, to make a double bond, and we have something called fumarate. Um, the electrons again are saved, so the energy here uh, uses the quinone uh, electron carrier. But regardless of which electron carrier it is, we are capturing uh, the energy. Uh, and then this continues, there's a hydratase, which is also a bit of an oxidation, uh, although in this case we don't extract any energy into energy carriers. Um, and then we have malate, and in a final step, there's another dehydrogenase, and we extract energy again, and we get another NADH. So as a sum in the cycle, we get one ATP in one of the steps, uh, we get two NADH in two of the steps, and we get this reduced quinone, the other electron carrier, in succinate dehydrogenase. Um, and ATP is actually a minor energy output overall in the cycle because the NADH is worth about 2-3 ATP each. Uh, and the uh, quinone also is worth a couple of ATP. Uh, so there's a lot of energetic molecules that we can generate in this cycle. Uh, and as you see, it's stepwise oxidation. And that's probably the reason the cycle exists. Uh, because it would be hard to extract all the energy that is available in an acetyl CoA unit in a single step. So here we have four uh, reactions that extract energy and pass it on to other energy carriers. Uh, and so th they can take care of this 
amount of energy uh, stepwise in, in a sequence. So that was sort of the oxidation perspective of the cycle. It can also be interesting to see this from a carbon perspective. So what happens actually to the carbons that enter the cycle as acid hook way? Where do they go uh, in the end? So let's look at this. So here I have, starting from the citrate synthesis reaction, I have numbered uh, the oxaloacetate molecule A, B, C, D, four carbons in there. Uh, and I have uh, labeled the carbons in acid hook way, E and F, two carbons in there. So if we look carefully at this reaction, pull out our biochemistry book and, and see which carbons go where, you can figure out that in this reaction, the carbons from acetyl-CoA end up in this part of citrate. So this is the E and F that is joining the cycle. Uh, whereas the carbons from oxaloacetate uh, end up in this part. But as you can see, they're a bit jumbled up. So it's kind of backwards. Uh, this goes A, B, C, D in this direction. Uh, and then in the first cleavage step, where we take off the first carbon dioxide, what gets cleaved off is the part A. So this is a part that came from oxaloacetate, uh, whereas the, <clears throat> the carbons from acetyl-CoA uh, stay intact. And when we go to the next cleavage reaction, uh, again, there's a carbon dioxide from, uh, or a carbon uh, from oxaloacetate that gets cleaved off. And this time, it's this part. And again, the acetyl-CoA carbons stay in the cycle. So we can see that in, in the first uh, sort of turn of the cycle, uh, the acetyl-CoA actually stays in. And there's a couple of steps more, uh, but these steps only involve oxidation uh, of the carbons. No, no other carbon is lost, so it stays the same. So that's kind of interesting. So the acetyl-CoA doesn't leave immediately. So where does it where does it go? At what point does it leave? So let's take a few turns through the cycle. And to simplify things a little bit, um, I have here drawn the uh, compounds only as, uh, as carbon atoms, the way we usually do when we look at isotope tracing. I've also skipped a couple of steps that are not important when we just consider the carbons. So if we start again with the oxaloacetate acetyl-CoA uh, reaction to form citrate, uh, let's consider that these two carbons are sort of new. Or if you're thinking about an isotope tracing experiment, you can think that you have labeled uh, these carbons. So they will end up in citrate, uh, and they will end up here. And then uh, in the first uh, reaction where we lose carbons, uh, this carbon, which does not come from acetyl-CoA, comes from oxaloacetate, will leave. Uh, we will have a five carbon compound left, uh, and the acetyl-CoA carbons will still be here. Uh, and then another carbon will leave as CO2, and we will be here. So this is exactly what we had in the previous slide. Uh, but a bit more simplified. So that's the first turn. Um, and now we have a couple of carbons uh, in succinate that came from our acetyl-CoA. So what happens now? So let's do the same thing over again. Um, and we continue to connect uh, the carbons by these lines showing which carbon is which. So now we get the new acetyl-CoA group in. Um, and if we follow the, the chart, uh, we see that our uh, original sort of label acetyl-CoA uh, atoms are now here in citrate. Uh, in the first uh, decarboxylation, again, we're not losing this, but in the second, we are losing one of them. So now in the second turn, we have lost one of the original acetyl-CoA molecules, uh, acetyl-CoA carbons. Uh, and we now have one of them left in succinate. And if we go through this in the sort of third turn of the cycle and repeat the whole thing again, we now see that uh, in the first decarboxylation here in the third turn, we finally lose the last uh, of our uh, carbons that came in through acetyl-CoA. Okay, so why is this interesting or important? Well, it's interesting uh, to sort of think about how the cycle processes carbon. So in a way, the TCA cycle is really not a cycle. It's kind of a spiral. It takes three laps through the cycle for a carbon to get oxidized completely. And so that's a bit interesting to know because some cycles are not like this. Some cycles actually uh, have uh, one part of, of the um, 
intermediates that stay in the cycle all the time, kind of as a cofactor, uh, and then the other parts enter and leave immediately. So the TCA cycle is a bit different. Um, and practically, this is important when you look at uh, isotope tracing uh, studies, because there you have to keep track of what is actually going where. So if that's not complicated enough, um, there is another caveat with this. So when we look at the TCA cycle molecules uh, carefully, we see that there are a couple of them which are actually symmetric. So what do I mean by that? Well, so when you get down to succinate, if you look carefully at this molecule, if you take this thing and if you turn it around 180 degrees, like that, uh, you see that you, you end up with the same compound. So this is called rotational symmetry. And it basically means that at the fundamental level, uh, these two carbons, E and F, are really kind of the same as these ones, C and B. So that means that uh, if you try to keep track of these atoms, as in isotope tracing, and you're keeping track of an atom that goes here, now you don't really know if it's in position E or if it is in position C. So this, this creates a bit of a, of a complication, and we have to take this into account when we look at isotope tracing data from the TCA cycle. So here's an example from the published literature. So looking at glucose oxidation in brain tumors uh, using NMR as a measurement method. Uh, this was of interest. People had previously seen that this particular type of cancer cells uh, used glutamine as a substrate uh, in vitro when you looked at this in cell culture. So cells tended to take up this amino acid glutamine and oxidize it for energy. But when people started studying this in vivo, in actual uh, tumors, then they saw that it was kind of the other way around, that glucose formed acetyl-CoA, uh, and this was used to form a bunch of substrates to provide energy and also actually synthesize glutamine, so kind of the other way around. And in order to see this and interpret this data, uh, you find that uh, the label acetyl-CoA forms a variety of, uh, of patterns in glutamine. Uh, and in order to account for these patterns, you have to consider the fact that uh, acetyl-CoA makes multiple turns uh, in the TCA cycle. In the first turn, it uh, provides a glutamine pattern that looks like this. But in the second turn, it provides other patterns. And so all of these are observed in the experimental data. And you would not account for them if you did not consider that there are multiple turns and also that at the succinate step, uh, there is this symmetry phenomenon so that you get both of these types of isotopomers uh, from labeled acetyl-CoA. So you actually see uh, in, in experimental data that these patterns appear, uh, and they are important to know about and account for if you're going to be able to explain uh, your observed data by metabolic mechanisms. So we have considered the TCA cycle as um, an oxidative pathway oxidizing carbon and making energy. And that's probably the most well-known function. But the TCA cycle also has a role in biosynthesis uh, as a source of precursor metabolites. Uh, and this is pretty much the opposite of what we considered before. So instead of uh, nutrients giving rise to carboxylic acids, which are then catabolized to carbon dioxide, uh, we are now uh, considering the TCA cy cycle as a kind of resource of these carboxylic acids. So they can be drained from the cycle and it can go the other way around. There are synthesis pathways that can turn these central metabolites into fat, uh, sugars, amino acids, and things that the cells need. So this is also a possible mode of metabolism for the TCA cycle. So but there is a problem uh, when we try to extract substrates from the uh, TCA cycle. So if we want to take out some carboxylic acid, like citrate, uh, for fatty acid synthesis, there is a loss of carbon in the cycle. And because we have this reaction citrate synthase that condenses one molecule of oxaloacetate with one acetate group from acetyl-CoA, uh, we have a requirement that oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA must uh, be in one-to-one -one ratios. You need to have as much of this as of this in order to make the, the cycle turn to synthesize more citrate. So whenever you deplete carbon from the cycle, like citrate, it has to be refilled somewhere 
Otherwise, when you come back to oxaloacetate, you would have a deficit. So lost carbon from the cycle must be refilled. And this is called anaplerosis, so kind of special term for the TCA cycle. So one common sort of anaplerotic reaction is the catabolism of glutamate to yield alpha ketoglutarate. So if you take out carbon from the cycle uh, as citrate to make uh, fatty acids, uh, then you have to refill it somewhere, and this is a sort of common uh, point of, of refilling the cycle. So that's anaplerosis. There's also a corresponding or sort of opposite problem when you oxidize other types of, of, of uh, nutrients uh, than acetyl-CoA. So for example, uh, branched-chain amino acids and also methionine, uh, when oxidized, gives rise to succinate, which feeds into the cycle. Uh, and the TCA cycle can oxidize that, but now you have the issue that you actually have a surplus carbon uh, when you get to oxaloacetate because you have added something here. And so that must be removed, must be drained out of the cycle somewhere. And a common point where this happens is that oxaloacetate uh, is removed, and this is called catapleurosis. So that's the opposite uh, terminology. Um, and um, this can then come back in some pathways and reform acetyl-CoA and keep the cycle turning. So there are these kind of stoichiometry problems or sort of flux balance problems in the TCA cycle uh, that uh, are important when other types of substrates are oxidized uh, or the TCA cycle is used for anabolic purposes. So there are a few accessory enzymes that are uh, important to sort of feed the TCA cycle and also carry out this anapleurotic and catapleurotic reactions. Uh, so the pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, enzyme or the complex uh, of enzymes called pyruvate dehydrogenase is the uh, system that controls pyruvate entry. So this is one important sort of gatekeeper. Uh, this controls entry of carbon from sugars coming from glycolysis into the TCA cycle. Uh, and pyruvate dehydrogenase itself is an oxidizing enzyme. So it uh, attaches CoA to a two carbon group that comes from pyruvate. Uh, pyruvate is three carbons, so one of these carbons, this particular carboxylate group, uh, is lost as CO2. And in the process, we gain so energy. So PDH uh, itself generates NADH. So this is also an, an energy yielding reaction. Uh, Pyruvate dehydrogenase, the complex, is a phenomenal sort of molecular machine. This is one of the largest enzyme complexes known. Um, in mammals, it's thought to have 88 subunits in a very special stoichiometry, and it forms this uh, phenomenal-looking uh, protein complexes. It's very large and has you know, intricate uh, regulatory structures and things like that. So if you're interested in these kind of things, I recommend looking into this. Uh, this complex is really fascinating. There are also some systems that allow regenerating pyruvate from oxaloacetate. As we said, this is an important uh, step in, in catapleurosis and to make the cycle able to uh, oxidize carbon from, from succinate and other sources than, than acetyl-CoA. Uh, so there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one system uses First, a decarboxylation, so it removes one carbon from oxaloacetate to make phosphoenyl pyruvate, or PEP. You might recall that this is a high-energy uh, metabolite in glycolysis. Uh, and so this actually enters the last step of glycolysis and then uses pyruvate kinase uh, to make pyruvate again. And then this can enter back into the TCA cycle via the pyruvate dehydrogenase step. Uh, so this is a way of taking one intermediate of the cycle uh, and turning it into pyruvate and into acetyl-CoA again. So this, these enzyme systems help the, the TCA cycle sort of stay balanced. Uh, another way of doing this, which is actually a bit simpler, uh, is malic enzyme. So this is an enzyme that uh, simply decarboxylates uh, oxaloacetate to form pyruvate directly. And this is a step that yields one NADH molecule, so this is also energy yielding. Uh, in comparison, if you look at this pathway, you can see that it requires uh, a triphosphate here, but it's regenerated here, so this is overall neutral. So these are some accessory enzymes which can be good to know about. 
So overall, we see that the TCA cycle is really a kind of a hub of metabolism. So this is a picture from a review in JBC a few years ago, which is really a good review, I think, of the TCA cycle and its function. It's worth reading. Um, and so you can see here that all sorts of substrates can feed into the TCA cycle. Uh, it can enter and exit at various points. So it's really a, a crossroads of metabolism. Uh, you can oxidize various things, and it can also be a source uh, of, uh, of carboxylic acids, which can be substrates for a lot of biosynthesis. Uh, so um, this is really as central metabolism as it gets. If you think back to the uh, bow tie model we had in the uh, introduction lecture, this is what sits at the center. Uh, and a lot of things can enter and exit this system.